For the past three years or so, as a journalist, I've been reporting on countries and people who are at a crossroads. Countries trying to figure out what they stand for, trying to figure out what they stand against, whether it's a power-hungry dictator or a restrictive status quo. And all the while, people trying to figure out who they've become in the process. So I've reported from Egypt, I've reported from Bahrain, Syria, Tunisia, all over the Middle East, a region truly at a crossroads, and it's people often stuck figuring out where to go, what to do. Uh, so before I dive in to these lessons I've learned by reporting across the region and some kernels of wisdom to give you to deal with your own crossroads, um, I should probably start with myself, because you're probably wondering how someone like me, relatively young, with no connection to this crazy, crazy region, uh, wound up smack dab in the middle of some of these really intensely profound and historic times. So I grew up on the east coast of America uh, in a small suburb outside of Philadelphia, relatively homogenous area. And I remember from a very young age, uh, sort of burying myself in back issues of National Geographic and uh, spending a lot of time online on, on Encyclopedia Encarta, which I had to access through a CD-ROM. This is like way back in the day, pre-Wikipedia. Um, and I remember being so entranced and fascinated by the diversity uh, that I was seeing. Uh, diversity of uh, religion, of lifestyles, of thought, of ideas things so seemingly far away from where I was living in this small suburb that I knew from a relatively young age I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I wanted to travel to these places and learn about the people there, the lifestyles there. And not only that, not only go to you know, experience different uh, cultures and lifestyles, but I wanted to report back to people from my hometown. Uh, people who don't really know what's going on outside of their backyards. And I, you know, I wanted to do this uh, in part because I wanted to show people how the crossroads that they face really aren't so much different than the crossroads people face thousands of miles away in all of these far removed places. Of course, you know, the crossroads and the challenges differ in magnitude and severity, but the, at the end of the day, there are some core base level human existential things people face all over the world. So with that in mind, uh, I first wanted to start reporting in the Middle East, which is a region um, very uh, misunderstood still uh, in America and in the West. It's very confusing to a lot of people. So armed with a Fulbright Fellowship, I moved to Egypt three years ago, and this was pre-Arab Spring. Uh, so while I was there, I was learning Arabic and trying to figure out a way to kind of slowly step into foreign reporting and journalism. And, you know, at that time in Egypt, it's kind of a boring place. All of the journalists were sort of sitting around, you know, wondering when Mubarak was going to die because that was kind of the big story. And, oh, by the way, he hasn't yet. And he's in house arrest in some nice mansion. But anyway, it's a different story. Um, you know, I, I was slowly kind of diving into it, uh, when lo and behold, six months into my Fulbright grant, the Arab Spring, this incredible, profound, monumental story, fell into my lap. Uh, and as I was reporting on this crossroad, I faced one myself. Because I was there on a Fulbright Fellowship, uh, at a very kind of tenuous and uh, uncertain time, potentially dangerous, the Greater Fulbright Commission in Washington, D.C. mandated that all of the Fulbrighters leave the region or else their grants would be revoked. Um, so at the time, I had to decide, oh, am I going to stay? Am I going to see my Fulbright project through? Or, oh, should I leave? But if I leave, I'm going to lose a good deal of money, which if you, know, you follow the media landscape in 2013, you know, money's kind of hard to come by as a journalist. 
Um, and all the meanwhile, I had my parents calling, being like, get out of there, what's going on? It's crazy. Uh, but ultimately, I decided to stay. And it was a short-term risk. It was a little uh, uncertain, but I'm glad at that crossroads I did stay because I don't know where I would be right now if I didn't, and I certainly wouldn't be in front of you all telling this story. So I'm going to share with you some kernels of wisdom I've picked up by reporting on all of these intensely fascinating crossroads. Uh, and when I do so, I kind of want you guys to just take a moment right now to envision a, a goal, something you have in mind, something that you want to achieve. Um, so think about it, visualize it. The only stipulation I'm going to put on it is that it has to be something outside of your comfort zone, something that makes you go, okay, so we're we visualizing. Um, first thing I've learned, um, well, I should say, as a journalist, I think of everything, for the good or for the bad, as a story. Uh, but this is instructive, in a way, because I think we should all look at our own lives as a story. And at the end of the day, while we all face things that are outside of our control, uh, things that we really have no control of, we're ultimately, and I know this sounds cheesy, but bear with me because it's true, we're ultimately the sole author on our story. We own the sole byline to our story. We can't control the twists and turns that inevitably come our way, but we can decide the tone of the story the attitude of the story. And as a writer, as a storyteller, I can honestly say that's the most important part of the story. The tone, the attitude of our life, of our life's narrative of any story uh, can be you know, the deciding factor between whether the story is a tragedy, a comedy, a romance, a horror. And at the end of the day, you have the control over picking what tone your life's narrative Holds. We hear this all the time, but really, take a chance. So many of the people over the past three years that I've interviewed, so many of these people, they never thought for a second there are many protests on side streets would wind up on the cover of Time magazine, uh, or that they would be able to topple uh, a dictator. And if you pick up, yes, the front page of the New York Times on any given day, you can see that right now a lot of people are you know, not happy with the course that their country's respective uprisings have taken. But at the end of the day, they've made a dent in the system. And that's all it takes. They got the ball rolling. A third kernel, again, as a journalist, um, I am all about questions. Questions are sort of my, they're, they're my currency. And they're a really powerful tool. Because I think so often in our lives, we focus on the answers. Like, oh, if I only had the answer to this, then I would know this. And if you know, I had this answer, I could be A, B, or C. But I think it's instructive for all of us to pay closer attention to the questions we're asking ourselves the questions that are guiding us, uh, you know, are, that, are, that are leading us to this kind of end scene or this goal that in your mind I had you envision. Um, I don't know what number I'm on. I think it's the third thing. Um, everyone is a teacher. Everyone in this room can teach us something about our lives. And I'm constantly reminded um, of this as I interview people, whether they be philosophers or street vendors, um, what have you. There are so many things people can teach us that it often, it almost makes my head explode. Uh, so last week, <laughs> I liked her, she was cute. Um, so last week I spent time in Antakya on the Syrian border. And I was interviewing this wonderful, resilient, uh, extraordinary uh, Syrian refugee family. And they've lost basically everything. 
Uh, they're a family of 13 packed into a two-room apartment. And as I was talking to them and hearing their stories, it was just so depressing. I, I probably should spend time with you on your couch, Denise. You should probably talk me through it. But it was so utterly depressing, uh, just the, the tales they were telling me. And I had my head buried in my notebook, kind of you know, writing all the details down, making sure I got all of the points down. Uh, and as I was doing this, I heard the children around me and the adults cackling. They were laughing. And I'm like, dear God, I'm on the brink of a nervous breakdown. What could they be possibly laughing about after telling me all of these sad stories? And the grandfather of the family who was sitting on the couch, the only piece of furniture this family owns that was gifted from a Turkish charity. He was sitting on the couch and I realized that he had gone into my bag and taken out my, my big oversized sunglasses and just put them on and he was just sitting there, just rocking out with them. This 70 year old guy, he had just told me about his epic escape from a, you know, on a cargo truck from Hama to, to Turkey and during all that, he just decided, oh, I'm just going to put these sunglasses on and I'm just going to sit here with my sunglasses. And I thought, you know, this is awesome because it was a moment of comic relief. But what it was, was his, his taking control over the narrative, the, again, the tone, the attitude of the situation, and deciding that at this epic and kind of paralyzing crossroad, he was just going to smile and he was, he was gonna, you know, try to make the most of it and just laugh his way through it. Um, the last thing I wanna mention, um, I can't even remember the end point of my stories or the ending of most stories. It's kind of the bulk of things that happen before that, all of those paragraphs that are the beauty of the tale. So when you, you know, every day approach your life as a story of which you are the sole author and the creator, really approach each page and be a mercenary of experience and, and take those chances. And as you know, you wind up at a really difficult crossroad, you're not quite sure what to do, be the person who decides through it all to reach into the nearest bag they can find and whip out the big oversized Anna Wintour, you know, fake Chanel or real Chanel sunglasses, put them on and smile through it all. Um, so, I mean, Heidi, write your story. I would love to read them. <laughs> Thank you.